The sound of approaching hoofbeats made Meave turn to see Reynard spurring on his panting horse, galloping at a breakneck speed towards her. Ill tidings I bring you, Grace. Clearly. Glad tidings never arrive with such urgency. Our scouts captured a Nilfgaardian messenger. He was travelling in disguise and by night. When he realised his capture was imminent, he strove to destroy the letters he carried. We were able to salvage some in parts. Anything of interest? Yes, there is, I fear. Your Majesty, you must listen. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. Hail Keritzer. A traitor. We might have expected as much. Nilfgaard has shown amply that it abides only by the rules it sets. Since they have not proved able to defeat me in the field, in open battle, they seek other means. I suppose the scroll bears no name. It does not, Your Grace. The messenger. Have you questioned him? Naturally, Your Grace. Alas, he knows not to whom the letter is directed. He was to leave it in an agreed spot. I take it tidings of the whole affair have spread throughout the force? Yes, Your Majesty. The witnesses were too many to keep this fact a secret. We must thus assume the traitor in our ranks knows it as well, and will make no attempt to retrieve the scroll. A dead end. Have we any other leads or clues? None I fear, Your Majesty. We must be alert. Keep a keen eye on events as they unfold, and exercise great caution in forging new acquaintances. Very well. Eyes wide open, all senses attuned. Yours in particular, Reynard. Of course, my liege. Meave's force neared Davor's abyss. Signs of beastly feasting were not hard to find. Countless paw and claw tracks were impressed in the blood-stained snow. Among the boulders, bones picked clean were strewn about. Gascon lifted one from the ground. Empty inside, he said. Something sucked out the marrow. Meave's soldiers feigned indifference to the grisly sight. They marched on, their stepped rhythm unwavering, a song on their lips. Yet hearing a slight tremolo in their voices, Meave knew they merely sought to drown out their fear. A moment later, a commander's horn sounded, the signal to halt. The queen galloped to the fore of the column and found herself at the edge of a vast, round hole in the ground. She could not see the bottom. Meave drew her reins tight to prevent her mount from taking even one step forward. What is this? A crater? A desiccated lake? A mine of the strip variety, Gabor explained. Treasures we picked and shoveled for here. Diamonds. Till we happened on the beasts, that is. What now? Orion's a dam. Holds back a lake. If we can break it, water'll rush in, fill the abyss and the tunnels from which the beasts emerge. Just need to get around the mine first. We downs on the other side. Meave squinted and gazed into the distance. Indeed, there was the dam. And at its foot, a swarm of beasts roiled about. Her soldiers gazed at their queen expectantly, their arms at the ready. She knew well they would rush into battle, in spite of their fear. Gabor! Meave cried out over the whirling wind. Have you bards here in Mahakam? Course, Your Grace! Then we shall give them good reason to compose this day, on the themes of courage! Of heroism! Of Lyria! Gee up! And with that cry, the queen spurred her mount, grabbed a banner, and raising it high over her head, rushed headlong at the horrid swarm. Here's the way down! We need to break through and destroy the dam! And indeed, Bard sang of this battle soon after. For no claws or fangs could break through the wall of shields the Lyrians raised that day and no scales could protect the beasts from the Lyrian stinging arrows and blades. Fight! Do not relent! Let us show these beasts! It is they who should fear us! The queen shouted. In the end, the beasts turned to flee, yet Meave's force cut off any chance of escape. 
a solid wall of men began to push the monsters ever closer to the edge of Davos' abyss. Pressed from all sides, the horrors began slipping over the precipice, screeching terribly as they fell. Silence came at last. The queen stood at the edge of the precipice, breathing heavily, leaning on her sword. From the depths of the mine came muted growls and groans. Let's flood the damn hole, hissed Gabor, before any other shite crawls out of it. A rush of icy water suddenly rose, then just as abruptly plunged into the mine, flooding the pit. And where once lay Davor's abyss, now lay Davor's pond. Meave descended back into the pass, exhausted and covered in beastly blood, yet also exceedingly pleased. She was one step closer to Dwarven support in the war against Nilfgaard. Once the Lyrians had put some distance between themselves and the now destroyed monster lair, Meave ordered her men to pitch camp. Then she sent the quartermaster off for food and drink. The soldiers lit campfires, then set aside their weapons. Soon after, lively music and song could be heard throughout the camp. Your Majesty, Raynard said from behind Meave's back. A messenger from the Elder-in-Chief. The Queen turned to see a dwarf in a richly adorned jerkin and a shako with golden seams. She stifled her laugh into a smile and lifted her chin proudly, expecting praise and a pledge of aid in the war against Nilfgaard. My lady, your daring deeds have come to the Elder's attention, said the dwarf in a measured voice. He's positively irate and demands an explanation. Irate? But why? I and my men, we've aided you greatly. Elder Hoog awaits at the Long Bridge. Yet be ways not to keep him there any length of time. And with that, all the Queen's enthusiasm for a celebration was instantly gone. She waited until the fires expired and the songs died down, then gave the order to march. Frozen. All. Only the banner moves. Blown by the wind. Downright poetic. Prime material for a ballad. Perhaps even a whole saga. Gazing towards the horizon, Meave noticed a dark shape outlined against the mantle of snow that lay on the ground. It proved a tower, toppled and broken in pieces. Around it lay the ruins of other buildings, blocks hewn out of basalt rock protruding from the permafrost. That'd be the Clan Vidmar ruins, said Gabor, hollering over the wind. Rich ones had their clan seat here till earth tremors turned all into dust. Hundreds of dwarves lived here once, and now, not a living soul. Ah! Uh, help! Save me! On the contrary, there was someone midst the ruins, and said someone was clearly in trouble. Meave ordered her men to find the unfortunate soul. They returned moments later, leading a dwarf whose teeth chattered. They had found him in a ruined building where he'd sought shelter from ghouls. Judging by his appearance, the dwarf had spent the better part of a week there. Marco Vidmar, they call me, he said, patting down unkempt hair that seemed to reach in all directions. I came here seeking a family heirloom, lost in the tremors and the chaos they caused. I ken the chamber where it ought to be, but, well, beasts made the lair there. I cannot drive them off on my own, but bold warriors like you ought to cut them down in a jiffy. So, will you help? I too have lost my home, estate, said the Queen, so I understand well what you feel. I shall help you recover your heirloom. Call it a whim. Mirko Vidmar's face lit up. Though he'd spent a week besieged and eating stale biscuits, and though there was a hoarfrost in his beard, he quickly trotted to the front of the column and led the Lyrian soldiers to the underground chamber. As promised, beasts awaited there. The ruins! From there they come! Drive them back! Let's get a move on before any others show up! As soon as the fight was done, Mirko Vidmar ran towards a crate that stood on a pedestal, slipping on the now bloody floor. When the dwarf lifted the lid, precious stones spilled out. Your heirloom? This? Asked the Queen, rather puzzled. I thought a pipe that belonged to your grandfather more likely. 
Seems to me Brother Murko was nae wholly candid with us. This here's no heirloom, no family souvenir. It's the treasure trove of Clan Vidmar. We thought it gone for good. Pressed for the truth, Murko admitted no family sentiment had prompted this expedition. The dwarf had planned to leave Mahakam and start a new life among humans. Yet he did not wish to do so without sizable capital. I can't stand to stay here a moment longer. The days, all of them, they're identical. Rise with the first cockscrow, march in double file to the latrine, crap on command, twelve hours down the shaft and home to sleep. Mirko complained. One to wifey, put on an application, in triplicate. Care to snip your beard? Elders got to approve it. You want to add buttermilk, not cream to your mushroom soup? Clan council's got to debate it. How's a dwarf not to get balmy? I understand the lad, no two ways about it. Gabor sighed. But I feel it's my duty to remind you that what Marco's going and doing here, well, there are laws. Treasure's due the Elder in Chief, not to Marco. That's one. Second, any dwarf that wants to leave Mahakam can't take nothing but his breeches, his Dixie, and his coat. So, brief like. Consider well afore you make your decision, Your Grace. I sympathize, Mirko, said Meave. But I'm a crowned head. I must decline. National interest requires I show the greatest possible care for my relations with Elder in Chief Hoog. Yet in aiding you, I could sour those greatly. I shall return the treasure to him. I must while you do what you will. Mirko Vidmar swore under his breath, then jostled his way through the Lyrian infantry and into the mountains, towards human lands. The Lyrians rode a narrow, winding path along the rocky ridge. To one side were ice-covered boulders, to the other, a chasm hundreds of feet deep. They could have at least erected some barriers, complained Gascon, knocking snow from his cap. Got plans for that, Gabor said. Just need to decide how high to make them. What? Think, shouldn't they be the height of your average dwarf or a human? The debate's gone on for 20 years. On the one hand, you've got... Gabor did not finish his discussion. He was interrupted by the Barbagazi that jumped down from the rocks. Archers, shoot! Aim for on the belly! Meave soldiers made quick work of the lone monster. But the sound of battle spooked the horses harnessed to one of her wagons. Whoa there! Whoa! Damn it! The driver tried to rein in the animals, but could not. They dragged him into the chasm along with his cart and the soldiers riding in it. They landed a few dozen feet below on a rocky outcropping. A moment later, Barber Ghazis swarmed everywhere. Did you see how they fared? Anyone left alive? Asked Meave, leaning over the cliff edge. Worry more about their cargo, Gascon replied. They were also carrying chests of gold. Blast. We can't get down there. Too steep and the snow keeps falling. We can lower ourselves down a line. But without armor, shields, or heavy weapons, otherwise it will snap. And the Barbagazis? The Queen said, brow raised. We shan't kill them with daggers. They're too thick of armor. We'll have to try. Or continue on our way. You only live once. Meave sighed. Gascon, round up some volunteers and let us move out. Moments later, the Queen was lowering herself down a line straight towards the gaping maw of a Barbagazi. Her only armor, a woolen shirt. Careful! No one try to be a hero! Bereft of sword and shield, Meave could not withstand a single blow. She thus danced atop the frozen snow, deftly dodging the Barbagazi's lightning-fast strikes, while delivering but a few well-aimed hits of her own to their eyes, ears, and gaping jaws. When the last monster fell lifeless to the ground, Meave walked up to the shattered wagon. The soldiers it had carried were bruised, frostbitten, but alive. Your Grace, we were sure you'd leave us. A good ruler never abandons her folk. Nor her gold, Gascon interjected, while securing a rope to a chest. Soon enough, all were safely back on the path. The admiration Meave saw in her soldiers' eyes was in itself sufficient reward for her difficult battle. Meave now witnessed a sorry sight. 
a mass funeral for miners killed due to a tragic convergence of events. Their lead caskets lay upon the snow, wreaths of hop cones laid upon them in turn. The mourners waited for the diggers to finish. The digging was tough, for the ground was frozen. As the crunch and thud of picks and shovels continued, the dead miners' foreman scrambled onto a boulder to make a speech. Angry shouts and loud booing stopped him. You knew it! You knew they'd smell vapors, but you ordered them to keep digging till it blew up in their faces! Make the daily quota whatever the cost, eh? You have blood on your mitts, whore son! A mourner then picked up a chunk of frozen ground and threw it at the foreman. Blood spurted from the gash that appeared on his forehead. The first dirt chunk was followed by another, then by a rock, a brick. Meave realized that if she did not intervene, the foreman stood to be stoned to death. Something had to be done quickly. Meave saw this clearly. She spurred her mount and rode into the cemetery, pushing through the throng, then stopping before the foreman, the horse shielding him from further blows. Calm yourselves! Silence! His guilt cannot be decided here! It must! Before Meave could finish her plea, a large rock thrown from the crowd struck her bosom, nearly knocking her from her saddle. Upon seeing this, her Lyrian escort lowered spears and drew swords and rushed at the angry mourners. Isbel cried out. Her hands began to radiate a fierce light that blinded both dwarves and Lyrians alike. Have you lost your minds, all of you together? Not had your fill of misfortune yet? Lower your arms at once. Whether the power of Isbel's magic or the force of her appeal had the greater effect is difficult to say for certain. Either way, both sides suddenly lost the desire to fight. Meave breathed a sigh of relief, aware that if not for Isbel's intervention, a great amount of blood would have been spilled at that cemetery. Knew there'd be a stink cause of this. The Lyrians ascended the highest section of the Mahakam range. Snow crunched under their boots, cold air stung their lungs, and the wind snapped at their cloaks. <sighs> Meave wiped sweat from her brow and turned to Raynard. There, by the rocks, we shall... The rest of her words were drowned out by a powerful blast. The entire mountain rumbled with a low, vibrating roar. The sound grew louder, echoing off the rocks, splitting their ears. The Lyrians looked around, disoriented. Few heard Gabor's warning. Then I just stand there! Get behind the rock! Quick! Hurry! Meave followed the dwarf's gaze and cried out in terror. The snow stuck to the mountainside had started to slide down the slope, sending up mists of icy dust. Before she could react, the white torrent knocked her to her knees, crushing her and smothering her into the ground. All she felt after that was all-encompassing cold and fear. Meave survived. The dwarves who ran to the Lyrian's rescue dug her out of the snow in time. Some of her soldiers were not so lucky. The queen looked at their bodies, blue, frozen. Next to them lay dead horses, demolished wagons. The losses were enormous. Meave wiped her cheek. Her tears burned her frozen skin. Gabor spoke a while with the leader of the Mahakam Guard Patrol that had come to their rescue. His face was dour. What? What have you learned? I'll tell you all in good time. First, you need a warm drink, good victuals. No, Gabor. I need to find out what in blazes happened here. Well, it was an avalanche. Of course it was an avalanche. I'm no fool. But what caused it? What was that noise? Um, <clears throat> Signal horns. Ours. So you brought this snow down on us. Dwarves! Well, I, but, uh, unawares. I'm extremely curious how one sounds a horn without being aware of it. That must be quite a sight. Meave, let me explain. I will. 
and the explanation better not sound like a clumsy excuse. See, we clean our mount regularly. The, the, the way men folk shovel snow off their roofs. Otherwise, the whole shebang would come tumbling down in our heads. When snow's gathered deep enough, we blast our horns to cause a controlled avalanche. Then we need to, but, sweep up a wee bit and the road's safe. All well and good, but why did you decide to clean up right as I was passing through? I'm wondering that myself. Schedule says next cleaning should have been a week from now, but someone has the route to be cleared earlier. Who? Me, but I'll tell you. But first, promise you'll... Who? Hey. Ovin Ep Klenvok, the Nilfgaardian emissary. Think it were meant as revenge for attacking their caravan. The bastard. Reynard! Reynard! Wait! Wait! I understand you're a wee bit upset. You've every right. But you'll never prove Ovin meant you harm. The sly weasel makes sure he didn't dirty his own paws. I've no such scruples. I'll find him and kill him. And then? How'd you tell that tale to Bruva? Meave, you're justly taught, but for the love, just this once, let it go. Or you'll leave Mahakam with near a scrap to show for it. Moments later, scouts reported Ovain was camped to the north of the accident site. Meave had to decide how much she was willing to risk to get her revenge on the Imperial Emissary. By the Elder Sideburns, I had no notion anyone was in the Vale. There, my lady, whispered one of the scouts. Left of the path. Meave squinted. The Nilfgaardians had taken shelter from the falling snow under a rocky outcropping. The smell of roasting meat wafted from their campfire, and echoes of laughter could be heard. The black-clad soldiers had reason to celebrate. They had just decimated Meave's company without even drawing their weapons. Meave's gaze caught something else. A metal container into which the Nilfgaardians tossed bones once they'd been gnawed clean. It looked strangely familiar. Only after a moment did the Queen understand it was an overturned Lyrian helmet dug out of the snowy grave of one of her men. The Horsons! Meave hissed. They'll pay for this. Meave! Asking your last time to keep a cool heat! Whispered Gabor. You want vengeance? I get it. But think of the cost. If so much as a hair gets plucked from Ovain's head, Bruver will never forgive you. And you can kiss any hope of aid goodbye. Silence followed. Finally to be broken by one of the scouts. Milady, what's the order? Do we attack? No, said the Queen after long deliberation. But, my lady, they... I know what they did, and that I shall never forget nor forgive, said Meave, placing a hand on her scout's shoulder. But breaking Dwarven law only plays into the North Guardian's hand, causing us to lose allies and our chance for victory. Meave brushed the snow from her trousers and straightened her spine. Avenge our comrades we shall. Not here but in the fields of Lyria and Rivia. The Lyrians resumed their march with heavy, beleaguered steps, their path still piled high with the snow brought down by the Nilfgaardians. While passing the mining settlement of Kolstok, Meave heard the sounds of battle. hey ho Into the fray, lads! Expecting she would see monsters swarming dwarves, the Queen set off at a gallop to the rescue. Her braid blew about in the wind like a banner, showing her men in which direction to attack. The dwarves she saw, however, were not engaged in a battle against Shalemars and Barbigazis. No, they were going at one another. Luckily, no weapons had yet been drawn, but given the dwarves have hands the size of bread loaves, this did not necessarily mean there would be no deaths. Oi, lads! roared Gabor Zigrin. What's this foolishness? Calm the hell down, damn it! Gabor's intervention proved successful. The dwarves limited themselves to verbal jousting. Meave, who was no stranger to barrack room talk, nonetheless turned crimson at the dwarves' cursing. Piecing together the obscenities, Meave concluded they were debating an old quarrel about the height of a certain mountain. 
or rather of the twin peaks atop it. One of them lay in the territory of Clan Dahlberg, while the other in the Hoogsland. Each family felt their peak was the highest, all measurements indicating the contrary being total fabrications. Queen! started Gabor, nervously chewing his moustache. They're asking if you, as yin impartial and a fair-minded wench to boot, wouldn't he wish to settle their idiot squabble once and for all? Meave knew well that this type of age-old quarrel could easily end in bloodshed, so she resolved to help. Representatives of the two clans gave her a strange mechanism she was to use to measure elevation. All that was left was for the queen to button her coat up to the neck and scale the twin peaks. When she and her force had travelled half the way to the first, she heard a long roar that made snowshells detach and descend. Without waiting for her scouts to return with reports, Meave drew her sword. The Lyrians managed to repel the monsters and reach both peaks. Upon each, Meave ordered her men to take the measurements. While waiting, she admired the breathtaking view of the Mahakaman Massif. The dwarven contraption left no room for doubt. The peak within the Dahlberg clan territory was two feet higher than that within Hoog territory. Gabor was clearly displeased with the results. Oh, damn it all! I'd hope you'd prove Bruver's clan was in the right. He'd have been content to see the Dalbergs knock down a peg or two, and possibly he'd have been more inclined to help you, said the dwarf in frustration. Then, after a pause, he added, Although, only you saw what the device showed, Queen. Perhaps you could, uh, recalibrate the results a wee bit? To lie would be simple, true, said Meave. Yet to forget the matter would be so much harder. No, Gabor, I shall tell the truth. The Queen's tone made it clear the discussion was over. Gabor let the matter lie, and Meave's force began its descent down the mountainside. The dwarves of both clans had been waiting with bated breath for the expedition's return and report. As soon as Meave announced the results, the Dahlbergs rolled barrels of beer out into the square and began to celebrate. Naturally, the Hoogs were disappointed, yet they accepted Meave's results as final. At last, they had come to trust her. Dahlbergs are the dwarfs we need! Every Hoog's a dunderheed! As Meave neared Langbridge, she ordered her bugler to announce her arrival, then retired to her tent to freshen up. Gascon was already inside, awaiting her. I do not seem to recall summoning you. In that case, I must tell you to fret not. Nothing wrong with your memory. I've come with no agenda. Spontaneously, call it, to chat. Hmm. Then I propose you leave. Just as spontaneously, call it. I must don fresh clothes. I'm to see the Elder soon, and I'd prefer to not smell of horse sweat. Doubt it'd make much difference to him. And be assured, I know what I speak of. When last we met, I found myself standing downwind of him. A pungent experience. Well, Hugh was saved the experience of his breath. So pungent I thought I might faint. Well, to revive you, pinch you awake, I'm sure would be quite a pleasure. Gascon, I beg your pardon. Ugh, I shall have nightmares now. Not tonight, for I fear you might not sleep at all. You see, there's something you ought to know, and decidedly before you meet with Bruva. The sights we cleared of beasts, I ferreted a bit, noted something peculiar. Any notion what it was? None. The monumental dwarven architecture, perhaps? Bones, my dear Meave. Dwarven bones. Now, guess what I found on them? Wait, don't dare give me any hints. Bite marks. Of course. After all, they'd been gnawed clean of all flesh by monsters. Incidentally, making it quite easy to spot other markings. Ones made by axes and swords. To be certain, I showed the bones to our medics. 
and they confirmed my conclusion. Meaning what? That the entire clan, the Fuchses, did not perish due to an invasion of beasts from the depths. The monsters merely ate the bodies and occupied empty homes. Now, I shared my discovery with Gabor, and guess what he did? He panicked. He started to squirm, babble nonsense. I wager my right arm, he's hiding something. Blast. Overly eager to aid us from the start he was. I might have sent something. I shall have him summoned at once. And I thank you, Gascon. I won't forget this. Minutes later, Gabor stood before the Queen. At first, he tried to mislead her with evasive answers, but as her pointed questions demolished one clumsy excuse after another, he had to give in. Oi. As King Desmond said after a hefty squirt in his hose, we can't sweep this under the rug. If you think I welcome jests in this moment, you err. My fingers itch to summon the hangman. Right. So. Tis true. I misled you. On our clan elders' orders. Supposed to make sure you destroyed Boris Rump and Davor's abyss thoroughly enough to leave nay a trace. What? Why? What did they wish to hide? They was home to the Fuchses, our mortal enemies. They'd been a-boiling our heinies for ages, thumbing their noses, taking what they want, when they want, and the Elder-in-Chief didn't give a ploughing wit. So to stop them, our clan, we did the unpardonable. The Zigrin Elders saw their chance and they... Gods. So you were responsible for the deaths of all those dwarves? Me? I, I didn't raise a finger. Tried to stop them, in fact. No witnesses survived. Meaning you must have murdered the entire clan. How? Queen. You sure you... I am. And you should be sure to answer in full, omitting no detail. A few years back, we got pummeled by a horrendous winter. Stone-breaking frosts, white-out storms, avalanches. Made travelling a painful form of suicide. Hunger drove beasts out of their dens. Pass was covered in the filth. Got to where they paced right outside the walls. Fuchses fought a hard, bloody fight to keep the critters out of Davar's abyss. Lost near every axe-wielding dwarf they had. Only survivors had to winter at Burr's Rump. Our elders felt such an opportunity wouldn't knock again. After killing the town's meagre guard, they... They set fire to it and barricaded the gates. They... They didn't stand a chance. Bastards. How in the world did the truth go undiscovered? Once it were over, our dwarves opened the gates. Before they'd lit their pipes, starving beasts came crawling out of the pass. The stank of dead flesh were strong. Zigrins who came back from that never were the same. If you'd only gandered their gaze when they had us all take a vow of silence. And then... You invented that blarney about primeval monstrosities the Fuchses had awoken by mining too deep. A riveting tale, and one with a moral to boot. Aye. But the Elders worried Bruver would suspect something all the same. That's why they wanted you to destroy all the evidence. Repugnant. You claim not to have taken part, but neither did you do anything to stop the massacre. What was I to do, exactly? The Elders had decided. Nay, a dwarf would listen to me. You might have informed the Elder-in-Chief. The guilty would have been punished. The guilty? You didn't ken Bruva. He'd punish the whole clan. Women, children, no exceptions. Meave, Queen, I'm begging you. He cannot ever learn of this. Aye, I want a hack flame too when I think what the Elder's done. But t'other way it'd bring but more pain and death.
You've got a lot of nerve, making requests after lying to me. Trying to ensure you can the stakes. But you'll do as you see fit, like always. I need to consider what's right. Meanwhile, Gascon, make sure Gabor remains our guest. Of course. I'll let you know if he so much as rolls his eyes towards an escape route. Bruva stood by the bridge like a statue, arms crossed, eyes squinting. Meave sighed inside. She stood little chance of having a pleasant chat. Elder in Chief, sir. No Sharon and Grayson here, lass. Plowed humans. Always out to fix things, always end up cocking them up. You think you're due glory, do you? Monster Slayer Meave? Patroness of dwarves? Blast it. What do you think? Why didn't I exterminate those beasts myself, eh? Go on, tell me! For you. For I didn't want to. For something didn't affect, damn it. So I resolved to not destroy their nests and evidence till I learned the truth of who done it. Postponed it all those years expressly. Though your subjects were dying. I didn't need no lectures from the likes of you. Justice must be served. That's worth any price. And I was close. Had leads. And now it's all gone to hell. You flooded Davor's abyss. You brought Boros rump down on itself. And I'll never ken who killed the Fuchses. Understand? Never! I would not be so sure. Sure of bloody what? That you shall never learn the truth. For I learnt it just moments ago. Twas the Zigrins who killed the Fuchses. The Zigrins? But hold, hold. I would explain a lot that. Ah, the snakes, worms, rogues. Why, I'll show them. All right. Got to admit you've more in that pretty heat of yours than I expected. But dinner you start thinking we'll be toasting a new friendship. You want our aid? You'll have to answer our questions. My questions. Lots of them. And they're all hard, so dinner you go smiling at me yet. Why, I wouldn't dare. Better not. Right. Time we moved on. Bruva set off at a brisk pace, paying Meave nor anyone else heed. The Elder's bodyguards rushed after him, then came the Lyrian force, and at its end trudged Gabor Zigrin, hands and feet in shackles. Dwarves demonstrate innovative thinking in many domains. Metallurgy, engineering, architecture. Yet there is one in which they could not be bothered. Naming. For this reason, the bridge that linked the Mahakam Pass with Mount Carbon was simply named Langbridge. Meave learned it was a thoroughly fitting name. Having stopped for a breath halfway across the road suspended over a deep chasm, the Queen could see neither end of the bridge, both concealed by thick clouds. Amazing, whispered the Queen. I feel as though we traversed the very sky. The Queen and her retinue were nearing Mount Carbon when Meave heard a cry. It was Xavier. Hold! Hold! Meave drew in her reins abruptly. Her mare neighed and reared, lifting the queen above her formation of men. From that height, she saw the last pier of the bridge crumbling. The dwarves at the head of the procession were unable to stop in time and plummeted, screaming into the abyss. What's the meaning of this, God damn it? Bruva roared. Face the engineers! No! The Queen was striving to calm her spooked mount when she sent something swish past her ear. Out of nowhere, a Scoia'tael band had appeared at the rear of the column. Before anyone could react, elven archers had felled the rear guard. The soldiers lay on the bridge's stone surface with arrows in their backs. Meave was trapped. In one direction lay the chasm, in the other, a fierce foe. She had no choice but to stand and fight. At last, Rena! You are mine! We trapped you, Grace, but we can try and fight our way through. I think you poor bags can do whatever the devils you please! This is Mahakam! 
No! Let her in! She must die! Their strength combined, the Lyrians and Dwarves managed to defeat the Scoia'tael. The guerrillas had weakened the last span of the bridge, turning the crossing into a deadly trap. Had Xavier, who noticed the weakened structure at the last instant not called out, all would have fallen into the chasm. The Lyrians managed to capture the unit commander. She stood, her head raised high, and when Meave glared at her, she did not avert her eyes. What is your name, Elf? Abayat me a parst one. She said, uh... Thank you, Reynard. I know well what she said. Kiss my ass. Is that truly the best you can muster? I'd rather show you exactly what I can muster. Tell them to unbind me. You got your opportunity. On the battlefield. Will you not tell me what they call you? Fine. It's all the same to me. I'm more interested to know how you came to be here. Who sent you? No one. It was my decision to kill you, and thus avenge Eldane. Do you remember him? The elf whom you denied a burial? Whom you left in an open field to rot? You've elven blood on your hands. The blood of the elves of the Mulderwood. I regret the events of the Mulderwood. I did not wish those elves' deaths. Yet they left me no choice. What choice would you give a murderer who invaded your home? <sighs> you know I envy you. To see the world solely as black or white, it must simplify things so. Enough. I've heard all I wish to hear. But I have not. Did you fall in your heed, elf, eh? If you want to fight humans, go on and do it. You cannot talk sense to Egypts and nay here, damn it. Mahakam is and will be neutral. You cannot be neutral. To Dwan, you are either their foe or their dog. Mahakam has stood aside sleeping long enough. That is why we struck it in its very heart. As a call to battle. A call to brethren whom you, Elder, have kept from the world too long. I have kept him away. I've been bloody right to do so. You want to play at war, you numpties? You want to force the Pontar to flow upstream? Gang right ahead! Good riddance, I say! Gang kill, gang die if you fancy! But God's damn it, leave us alone! Yeah, I should kill you. With my own hands, I should cut your throat, put you out of your misery! That's what you want, in it? To die? To die a stupid death? Well, I'll not grant you that. Nay, nay, I'll lock you in a tower. Sit there three centuries, and you just might grow a brain. Bruva Hoog gazed after the shackled elf as she was led away. Meave expected him to continue fuming, cursing her. But the dwarf stood silent. And his old eyes, half concealed by brows bushy as a forest floor, showed not anger, but the deepest sadness. Dwarven engineers made quick work of repairing the crumbled bridge span. Look, Mount Carbon. Damn, and I thought Novograd was big. The Lyrians stepped inside Mount Carbon's bowels. Meave rode while looking upwards, admiring the intricately carved ceiling, gilded walls, monumental bas-reliefs carved from basalt. Yet this was no time to admire the sights. Bruva Hoog had summoned her to speak. I thank you for your invitation, Elder. My invitation? Choice term, lass. You wangled your way in here. Long I've lived. But ne'er have I seen a wench so stubborn. With all due respect, do you not feel like a pot conversing with a kettle? Ha! <laughs> True enough. Changes of mind didn't come easy to me. But they do come at times. Human wars concern me not at all. For so many they are, who could count them? Near a year goes by without one wanking king invading another's realm. 
A dog with scabies is less restless. That's why this morning I aimed to send you off with nothing. Mattered not what the clans were saying. Revere, Schmevia, who gives a sheep's fart? But that was this morn, before that daft wench and her pups attacked. Nilfgaard supports the Scoyatel, it's common knowledge. Nilfgaard uses them. Well, I'm nay worse, and I choose to use Queen Meave. I shall be no one's tool, Bruva. I fight for my land and my land alone. Lyria and Rivia. Ah, keep your heat. You can fight for a free war field, far as I'm concerned. Doesn't matter. My aid doesn't come with conditions. Like to give Nilfgaard a warning, you can. If you're going to rile my dwarves, throw them into the Scoyatel ranks. You'll regret it, eh? But I'd like to issue the warning without declaring war. All clear to you so far. So, when you march out of Mahakam, you'll find a company of our foot dwarves waiting out with the gate. Officially, volunteers enlisting with you against my will. And you're to put them at the fore next time you face Nilfgaard. Want the blacklads to break their teeth on our bucklers, get a taste of our axe blades. After that, dare say they'll think twice before they send more Scoyatel into these hells. I do not... Thank you, Elder. You restore my hope that I shall have my home back in the end. Faith can move mountains, aye, but it cannot do much about borders. I've watched you close, and must admit you're a plucky lass. That enough for Nilfgaard? Can I be sure? We will see. We shall know soon. I would like to march at once. So by your leave? Nay, not granted. At once? What's that mean? Our laws are clear. Guests are to be sent off with a thundering feast. Even the humans. Bruva, as was Bruva's wont, insisted. So the Queen accepted the invitation. But as was her wont, set a condition. The feast was to last but one night and not as was the wont of local custom, an entire week. All clans were to be represented at the feast, save one, of course, the Zigrins, for they had already learned their punishment. The entire clan was banished from Mahakam. An exception was made for one of their number, for Gabor, who was beheaded before the day was done. When the sun had retired behind the peaks, the underground city came alive with the sound of bugles, bagpipes and horns. The dwarves emerged out into the central square and danced exuberantly, sparks kicking up from their hobnail boots. The usually crabby elder-in-chief Hoog proved a cordial host that evening. Let's drink, lest our neck shafts grow cobwebs! Suddenly a messenger arrived. Bruver lifted his copper horn to his ear and listened with furrowed brow. What's that? Speak up! When she saw a sour grin on his face, Meave knew the tidings were not good. Yet she did not suspect they pertained to her directly. Meave, you expecting anyone? How's that? Runner says a delegation's arrived at Carmen, Freluria and Rivia. Got a Nilfgaardian escort. How dare they? Traitors. Who leads it? Uh, you'd best sit. Who leads the delegation? It's your son, Willem, I fear. Willem? Mahakam remains neutral as regards all your squabbles. I trust I needn't remind you. So I'll have no scrambling nor shoving, and certainly no bloodshed. Point of fact, I'd prefer it if you... I wish to speak to him. I'd forbid you, but, as I said, never seen a more stubborn wench. All righty then, jabber away with him. Just remember, hands to yourself. Meave spotted banners, a Lyrian eagle upon one surrounded by Nilfgaard's black rags. Her hands became fists, showing how helpless she felt. 
Then her son and rival, Willem, emerged from behind a row of Imperial footmen. My, my. I should apologize. It seems I missed the coronation. Congratulations, my son. Who was it who placed the crown? General Epdahi? Count Caldwell. Ah, yes. Our elder statesman. Why have you come here, of all places? To acquire arms for Nilfgaard? As my official mission, yes. Yet unofficially, I wish to speak with you. I trust you've had tidings from the field. Edern turned to ash and dust. Vizimir murdered Redania in chaos. Faltus forced to strike a pact by his vassals betrayed. Hensult the same. This limerick, will it come to a point? Why, yes, to the same as this war. Mother, I beg you, you must see it. N Nilfgaard's victory is inevitable. Surrender now, and I shall show you mercy. For later, later it'll be too late. There will be no later. We shall repel them, drive them south at the points of our pikes. This we, Mother, who precisely do you mean? You stand alone. An impression many might have indeed. Yet I've allies, those long loyal and those new. Where, Mother? In Zeracania? For here, in the north, why? There are none. The fight is done. Your friends from Nilfgaard will learn that is simply not true, when their ignorance bites them in the arse. So you aim to persist? Whatever for? For our freedom. For independence. Curious. I could have sworn it was for your ambition, to soothe your wounded pride. When I was crowned, a fact you deride, though that makes it no less true, I swore the good of my subjects would guide me. And a war we are doomed to lose cannot in any way benefit them. And slavery can. You know well the Blacklads put peasants in chains, like cattle. Reprehensible, I agree, but... And resettlement? Forced labour? Cruel laws that make death the punishment for the slightest offences? Are those benefits? Well, answer me! I see I will not sway you, Mother. A shame, though I take comfort in the fact I tried. And now, a Jew. Oh no, I, not you, will decide when this conversation is over. Oh, have we anything else to discuss? Are you perhaps aware that the Nilfgaardians tried to kill me? What? No, I... I, I heard only about an avalanche. Which tumbled down through no small effort of an Imperial envoy. Never would I have agreed to such a heinous act. I believe you. I'm heartened that despite all we... I believe you because I believe the North Guardians wouldn't ever have asked your opinion. Think on it, son. Are you their ally or their tool? Can you ever be sure? I am the King of Lyria and Rivia. To serve my subjects' best interests, I am prepared to make even the most painful concessions. Might I leave now? Or is there more? Naturally. How did you know you would find me here? I... I received Nilfgaardian reports to the effect that you've been seen in the past. Oh, roses are red and so are your cheeks, my son. As ever when you're caught in a lie. Lyria is two weeks' travel hence. Had you received word only once I was here, we'd have been long gone from Mahakam by the time you assembled a force and completed the march. No. You were forewarned of our intended route. It means I've a traitor in my ranks. Another one. Get out of my sight, villain. And pray we only ever face one another on neutral ground. Meave struggled inside not to turn and gaze once more at her son. He'd changed since they'd last faced each other, grown manlier, and he wore the crown well. The Queen returned to the banquet hall. Her advisers shot her questioning glances, curious what she had discussed with Bruva. But Meave decided to keep the details to herself. One of them wore a Nilfgaardian lead around his neck. Until she knew who, 
she would have to remain vigilant. Feasting's done, Reynard. We must consider our next move. I've thought on it, Your Grace. We've strength enough to hit the foe, but still not the numbers to face him in open battle. So what do you propose? This war we cannot win alone, nor even with the dwarves at our side. But if we secure a victory, small yet symbolic, we shall show the other realms of the North all is not yet lost. Thus, I propose we attack behind the front lines, somewhere well clear of any major Imperial force. Where would you suggest? I'm considering Angren. To begin with, a thickly wooded marshy land, always helpful in clandestine operations. Secondly, the land strategically important, as it's the chief source of building material for Nilfgaard's fleets. All too little, I fear. Since we require a victory that would be symbolic, we must strike where it shall hurt, and Angren... Just recently welcomed a new regent in the person of Count Coldwell, my third argument. Naturally, if your majesty wishes, I'm prepared to present alternatives to this. No need. We march at dawn. Neve had toiled, cajoled, persuaded, and gained the Dwarves' support. She left Mahakam strengthened, markedly. Even so, the Queen was in a foul mood. For it was clear a traitor, a viper, nested among the Lyrians. Someone who had conveyed the Queen's plans to her foe. From this moment on, Neve would need to weigh every word she uttered, even in the presence of her closest associates. Your Grace, we must plot our course forward. Shall we take the Western Passage into Angren, or...? Not now. When, then? Dawn approaches, yet we know nothing of where... I will not repeat myself. The Queen knew she would learn the traitor's identity in the end. If need be, she would tear the name from the throat of another turncoat, Count Caldwell. Meave drooled at the prospect of seeing Caldwell in chains, then passing him to the hangman. Saddle the horses. I shall take the fall. The time for diplomacy, for preparations and negotiations had gone. Meave was to attack her foe at last, and she could not wait to do so.